Good morning. So good to see everyone here this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. I celebrate you being here and this church welcomes you this morning. If you're a guest with us this morning, please know how privileged we are and how grateful we are to have you here. I know a lot of people are here to hear the cantata and I know it's going to be a blessing for all of us. But most of all, know how much we welcome you. Guests, we want you to know that there is a guest center to your right. Someone will be there after the worship service to welcome you and answer questions you might have. But know most of all how we welcome you. If you will take your hymn books now and turn to responsive reading 16, and we will read this together as a call to worship. God the Father, the source of all being. Let's stand to read, and you will remain standing for the first hymn. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds among mortals. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. God, our Father, source of all being. God, our creator, master of color and shape, song and silence. We, your children, were created to celebrate you and to praise you forever. God, our revealer, author of wisdom and truth. We, your children, were created to seek you and to desire you forever. God, our redeemer, fountain of forgiveness and grace. God, our sustainer, manna in the wilderness. We, your children, were We go to God in prayer. It's an unusual number of prayer concerns this week, and I invite you to be in prayer. Many especially experienced grief this week. We want to remember those who have lost loved ones. Christy Leff, who tragically lost her brother in death. Also, Brian Mavoris, we want to remember, and A.P. Baker and John Irwin all lost parents this past week. We're glad that Janice Shea is home back in the community with her daughter following the, her fall of surgery in Orlando, Florida. We also want to remember Susie Jones, who's also home from the hospital now and doing better. We want to pray for Sally Bowman, who will be having surgery this coming Friday at Duke Hospital. It was good in the early service. Ken Barber was here, and we were very thankful for that. Well, it's really good to see Gilbert and Pat Packett to be able to be with us here today. We always love seeing you, so glad that you are here. What I want to do is we focus on the Lord's Prayer one last time today. As we go to God in prayer, I want to simply read each line and be still for a moment. I invite you just to consider prayerfully what that line means for you, and then the next line. And then after I do all that, we will pray the Lord's Prayer once more together as we look to this Lord's Prayer to lead us in worship today. So let us go to God in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
So, oh God, through your son, Jesus Christ, it is our desire, it is our need, it is our hope that you teach us how to pray as well. When our words run out and our struggles are so deep that we can hardly find expression, we thank you for this prayer. Pray at some deeper level this morning, the prayer will be come alive for us, be real for us, and speak to very much where we are. And so hear us once again as we pray our best prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We sing together the offertory hymn number 405, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. We stand and sing stanzas one and two. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us each day. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the faith you've shown in this church. We come now to return to you a portion of what you have so graciously given to us. And now we ask that you take it and bless this offering for the glorification of your will. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen.
Our Father, human beings in all ages and all cultures have wondered and speculated about the divine power that is behind all things. What kind of being could have created this world? If there is a God, what is he like? How does he behave? What does he desire? Is he angry or kind, benevolent or vengeful? How can we appease him or if necessary, protect ourselves from him? Who is God? Almost all religious and philosophical systems throughout history have developed in an effort to answer these kinds of questions. The Bible makes a stunning announcement. We can know who God is and what God is like, but not because we humans are finally smart enough to figure it all out. We can know God for one reason and one reason only, because God has chosen to reveal himself to us. Up there came down here. He chose to be one with us and we might be one with him. But here is the even more stunning announcement. This God who has revealed himself to us has revealed himself to us as our father. The word in the original Aramaic is Abba, the word we would translate daddy. All the trust, all the dependence, all the expectation a little child has for his or her daddy. To call God our father is to answer the question, who is God and what is he like? Jesus says that God is our Abba, our intimate, caring, devoted Father who has no needs expect, except to love and provide for us a fuller life than can ever happen apart from him. Father, it is how God longs for us to come to him for he wants to be in relationship with us.
thy name. How important is a name? In the ancient world, it was believed to know someone's name was to have a level of power over that person. That might sound like an odd claim to make, yet we can easily demonstrate that power even today. If someone calls your name across a crowded room, you instinctively will turn to see where the call originated. To know someone's name is to have a connection with that person. Perhaps this is why in the Bible almost always a special meaning is associated with different people's names. The name David means beloved, for David certainly was. Mary means bitter, for the tears she wept for her son. From the Hebrew, Barnabas was literally a son of encouragement. Even the name Israel has a special meaning. From the Hebrew, it translates, one who wrestles with God. A name tells something about who a person is. When God called Moses to go and lead his people to freedom, Moses wanted to know God's name. God answered with that enigmatic phrase, I am who I am. What does that mean? Essentially, it means that God can't be confined to the little boxes we want to put him in. Only God says who God is. To hallow God's name then, is to set his name apart from all others. It is to recognize that he is the power above all powers. He is the eternal, uncreated, transcendent, holy one who is at the center of all things. There is no one else like him in all creation. He is to be adored and honored and prized above all else, the beginning and the end. In a culture that, confu that confusingly seeks to honor the names of celebrities and the powerful, the Bible calls us to hallow God's name. His name is above all names because he is above all things. And when he is honored above all else, all else begins to fall into its rightful place.
thy kingdom come. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, King Herod responded by having all the male babies in the region slaughtered in an effort to eliminate him. It was a brutal act, but it reveals that Herod may have understood the implications of Jesus' life and birth better than most. Herod may have been ruthless, but he was also smart enough to recognize the threat to his power when he saw it. It is true to say that Jesus never sought to attain earthly power for himself. In John 6, there was a moment when people tried to lay hold of him and make him king by force, and yet we read that Jesus withdrew to a mountain to be by himself. Jesus was not interested in power in the way that the world often thinks of such things. But we are very mistaken if we think that Jesus was only interested in abstract religious concepts or formless spiritual principles. The central unifying theme of all that Jesus said and did was something he called the kingdom of God. And yet the kingdom is simple enough and concrete enough that Jesus says with his coming, the kingdom is now present among us, here, now. The kingdom is not some far place, far away place that we go to only when we die. The kingdom is present wherever and whenever God's will is done. And because God's will usually involves the overturning of the present arrangement, it is only natural that the rulers of this world will get nervous. When God's kingdom comes, man's kingdoms are threatened. When we pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, we are asking God to make his kingdom just a little bit more visible than it already is. We are daring to pray that through us, earth will come to resemble heaven just a little bit more until that great and glorious day when God's reign is complete.
us this day our daily bread. With this petition, the Lord's Prayer gets very basic. We move from high and lofty pronouncements about God's name and God's kingdom to something that is routine and simple. With these words, Jesus teaches us to see the mystery of God as something as ordinary as bread. It's hard to get much more basic than bread. Be forewarned. Those who learn to pray in this way should be prepared for cherished notions to be challenged. For starters, praying for daily bread quickly dissolves our artificial distinction between the physical and the spiritual. If we think God is concerned only with religious emotions or spiritual experiences, we should think again. He's also concerned with the very physical parts of life, like bodies and bread. If the last petition taught us to pray for God's kingdom to come on earth, this petition recognizes, teaches us to recognize that God's kingdom is a place where, among other things, everyone has enough bread. Praying for da daily bread also destroys our myth of self-sufficiency. In teaching us to pray this way, Jesus teaches us to ask God for something we foolishly thought we could provide for ourselves. To be sure, effort is required from us. We must work for our bread even as we pray for it. But God provides both the ability to work and the raw materials from which we work. Apart from God's providential care, we can no more provide for our own bread than we can create our own air. When we pray for daily bread, we aren't reminding God of something he might otherwise forget. Jesus teaches us that our Heavenly Father knows what we need even before we ask for it. This prayer is for our sake, that we might be humble enough to recognize our constant need for God's care, and that we might have eyes to see that care even in the most basic things of life. Perhaps bread isn't so basic after all.
forgive us our debts. All of us have been de in debt to someone at some point. It's honestly not the most fun place to be, to know that someone else has a claim against you. We are in debt, it means we're obligated to someone else. It means we are at their mercy. The scriptures say this is the nature of our relationship to God. We are obligated to him, and yet there isn't anything we can do to satisfy that obligation. Here lies the great dilemma of our human condition. But the good news of the gospel is that God does not use that obligation against us. In the mystery of the cross, he has settled all debts and now invites us to do the same to others. That means we do not have to live with our spirits shackled by weights of guilt and shame. We are set free to live the full and abundant life for which we were created. But God's willingness to forgive our debt does more than make us feel different. It calls us to recognize we are different. We are able to stand before God as those accepted and justified in his sight. It is because of that difference that we are able then to offer that same forgiveness to others. Notice in the prayer, Jesus teaches us to ask God to forgive others, to forgive us before he teaches us to offer forgiveness to others. It is God's forgiveness of us that makes it possible for us to forgive others. Just as the previous petition calls us to ask for our daily physical bread, this one calls us to ask for daily mercies, mercies that God is ready and able to give.
and lead us not into temptation. Contemporary discussions about spirituality often present the spiritual life as a way of escaping the struggles of daily life. Prayer has been reduced to a stress management technique. And Jesus is often talked about as though he has answers to all the questions and the solutions to all our problems. But the New Testament presents a different picture. To follow Jesus is not to escape struggle. In fact, we could even say that to follow Jesus is to enter into a struggle that we might not have ever known had we not followed him. That's because according to the Bible, the Christian life is a raging battle. The powers of evil are waging against the purposes of God. That battle is cosmic in scope and our lives are the battlefront. Seen from this perspective, sin is more than just an occasional breaking of a rule. It is a power that seeks to destroy us. Faced with that kind of enemy, we don't stand a chance of succeeding on our own strength. We are up against a power that is bigger than us, and our wisdom and insight will fail miserably short of seeing us through. That is why Jesus teaches us to pray this next petition. We ask God to deliver us from the power of evil precisely because we cannot deliver ourselves. We pray for God to deliver us from evil because we know that God is greater than any foe that will come against us.
for thine is the kingdom. Something unimaginable happened in the death of Jesus. Crucifixion was the ancient world's most cruel form of execution available, a way of humi humiliating the victim as the life slowly drained out of him. The crucifixion then should have been Jesus' single greatest moment of defeat. The cross displayed the scorn and derision with which the world looked upon everything Jesus said and did. And yet, in the unsearchable wisdom of God, the cross actually represented Jesus' greatest moment of triumph. Death and hell took its best shot at him, and yet he came out alive and victorious on the other side. The cross, intended to be an instrument of suffering and shame, turned out to be the sure sign of God's ultimate victory. But while the victory has been assured, it is not yet complete. Evil has been defeated, death has been destroyed, and yet for now the battle still rages on. And so we conclude this prayer with a declaration that the kingdom and the power and the glory already belong to God. In this petition, we are not asking God to bring something to be that otherwise might not be. The victory already is his, even if the world cannot always see it. In the meantime, those who would pray this prayer are those who will come to see their lives as the place where God's upside down kingdom will now become visible. A kingdom in which the last will be first, the humble are exalted, the poor are made rich, and the outcast blessed. A kingdom where human weakness becomes a vessel for God's perfect strength, and where sinners are recon reconciled to each other and to God. It's not the kind of kingdom this world has in mind when it searches for power and glory, but it is the only kingdom that is eternal.
of this offering of worship invites us to make a response. And if there are any this morning who wish to give your life to Christ or unite with this church for another church family or some renewed commitment, I'll be in the front to receive you. Let us stand and sing just the first and third verse, hymn number 680. You'll be seated for just a moment. Let me say there are many, many guests with us today. You heard something special was coming up. And we're glad that you came and participated in this. If you would like to have more information about our church, we would love to share that with you. Larry Barnes over at the Guest Welcome Center. Be happy if you would stop by, we can share more with you. Let me remind you of two important events coming up. We keep celebrating music around here. The Kairos Children's Music Ministry will present their spring celebration on Wednesday night, a large music program with all the children. I invite you to come out and be blessed by that. And then on this Saturday night is a youth spring show. We support youth missions. One of the most fun nights of the year in this church. Tickets are available out by the elevator. I hope you'll take advantage of that and come out. Have a great time Saturday night. So let me say on behalf of all of us, our appreciation to our minister of music, to this wonderful guest orchestra and all the talent that they and gifts they have brought us. And to you, our beloved choir, you have given us a gift today. I said in the early service, now I understand you're applauding. You couldn't help that. But really, there's a better way to express appreciation. This was not a performance. It was an offering of worship. And so we say this, and I prompt you. So you say out loud, thank you, God. Thank you, God. That's the real message. For God is the story behind all this and the one who's given us this prayer. And so we thank you for the blessing and truly, we have been lifted to a higher place in worship today. So having said that, let us bow for the benediction and the response to follow. Christ before you, Christ behind you, Christ within you. Grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, love, all love. Jesus Christ, our Lord, thanks be to God.